Hello, friends. Today we want to talk about the exciting and important life of Sir Francis Drake, who is known as the greatest pirate in history. While the exact date of his birth is uncertain, it's believed to be somewhere between 1540 and 1541. Francis was the oldest of 12 children born to a Protestant farmer named Edmund Drake and his wife, Mary Milwaukee. He was actually named after his godfather, Francis Russell, Earl II of Bedford. At a young age, Francis was sent to live with a relative, Sea Captain William Hawkins of Plymouth, where he began his naval training as an apprentice on Hawkins' boats. He gained valuable experience by trading along the coasts of England, the Low Countries, and France. The master of the ship was extremely impressed with Francis's behavior, and when he passed away without any children, he left his ship to Francis as a token of appreciation. Let's talk about the slave trade from Africa and how William Hawkins wanted to break the monopoly that the Portuguese and Spanish had over it. He embarked on four cruises, and Francis Drake was lucky enough to accompany him on some of these voyages. On their first voyage, they captured Portuguese slave ships and made a good profit by selling the slaves in India and Spain. This success earned them the support of Queen Elizabeth I for their next voyage, and she even loaned them one of her ships, Jesus of Lubeck. They were able to attack an African city and sell its inhabitants, which brought in a lot of money for the Queen and her investors. Unfortunately, Hawkins was banned from the third voyage due to pressure from Spain and Portugal on Queen Elizabeth. He tried again with the help of a relative named John Lavelle in 1566, but it was unsuccessful and didn't benefit him. Francis Drake accompanied Hawkins on the last voyage, and they were able to win the support of the King of Sierra Leone by helping him overcome his enemies. This allowed them to capture some slaves before they faced storms and attacks from other ships on their way back. While they were docked in a port for repairs, they were attacked by Spanish ships in what became known as the Battle of San Juan de Elva. During the Battle of San Juan de Elva, the British ships suffered a complete defeat, and only two ships were left. Francis Drake decided to leave the battlefield when he realized they were losing. However, William Hawkins returned to England with a small number of his men, and accused Drake of abandoning their service and stealing his treasures. Drake denied both claims, saying he thought Hawkins had been killed in the battle and that he had split all the money between all the soldiers. After the fourth voyage ended badly, Francis Drake changed his focus. He no longer pursued trade and slavery, but instead dedicated himself to invading Spanish property wherever he found it. In 1572, he embarked on his first independent expedition, which involved attacking the Strait of Panama and the transport route for Peruvian gold and silver bound for Spain. He seized the port of Nombre de Dios, which was the site of loading gold and silver. However, he was wounded and forced to leave the port without any loot due to the arrival of the Spanish fleet. Instead of attacking the port again, he decided to plunder the ships carrying gold and silver. He continued to regularly plunder and loot ships carrying royal Spanish cargo along Spain's main transport route. One of his most famous adventures was the seizure of the imperial silver cargo in April 1573, which made him rich and famous. Near Cabo de Cativas, Francis Drake encountered Guillaume Letestu, a French privateer who was in command of the 80-ton warship Havre. They joined forces and formed a combined fleet, Drake decided to intercept a mule ship at the Campos River, two leagues from Nombre de Dios. He instructed the captains of his pinnaces to meet them at the Francisca River on the 3rd of April to carry off the treasure after the raid. The combined English and French raiding parties marched through the forest towards the trail, with the Cimarrons performing reconnaissance. They surprised the mule convoy the next morning, the 1st of April, and seized more than 200,000 pesos worth of treasure. After their attack, Drake and his party found that they had captured around 20 tons of silver and gold. They buried much of the treasure as it was too much to carry and made off with a fortune in gold. Unfortunately, Letestu was badly wounded and captured. He was beheaded and the small band of adventurers dragged as much gold and silver as they could carry back across some 18 miles of jungle-covered mountains to where they had left the raiding boats. However, 
When they got to the coast, the boats were gone. Drake and his men were downhearted, exhausted, and hungry with nowhere to go, and the Spanish were not far behind. During this time, Francis Drake gathered his men and buried the treasure on the shore. They also built a boat and went to meet up with his companions. Drake showed them a Spanish gold and said, This is what we have accomplished on our journey. When Drake returned to Plymouth after the raids, the government had signed a temporary truce with King Philip II of Spain, so they were unable to officially acknowledge Drake's accomplishments. In England, however, Drake was considered a hero. In Spain, however, he was seen as a pirate due to his raids. After receiving investment from Queen Elizabeth and courtiers, Francis Drake set out on his first trip around the world in December 1577 with four ships. They first reached the Bay of St. Julian in present-day Argentina, where Drake decided to stay for the winter. Unfortunately, he had to behead his fellow commander, who had quarreled with him several times for treason and rebellion. Drake then crossed the Strait of Magellan and discovered several islands named after Queen Elizabeth. He stormed the western coast of Spanish America on only one of his remaining vessels and destroyed ports and cities in Chile and Peru. He plundered and captured several ships carrying Spanish gold, silver, and wine, making a fortune. The journey continued northbound, with Drake looting ships and ports along the way. He eventually took refuge on the California coast as he prepared to return to the UK. After leaving the Pacific coast, he continued his route to the southwest, reaching islands near present-day Indonesia. He then headed to the tip of Africa, and in July 1580, passed the Nose of Good Hope and reached Sierra Leone. In September of that year, he returned to Plymouth with many trophies. Half of the Queen's share of the trophies was the total size of the budget for one year. Drake was welcomed by everyone as the first Englishman to circumnavigate the world. He showed his appreciation to the Queen by donating a jewel emblem, and in return, the Queen gave Drake a gift of Drake's jewel, made of diamonds, rubies, and pearls. Drake was the first ordinary person to receive such a gift, and it was a great honor for him. In April 1581, Queen Elizabeth knighted Francis Drake, and he soon became an MP. He also served as mayor of Plymouth and implemented useful measures for the city and the prosperity of trade. In 1585, war broke out between England and Spain after the signing of the Treaty of Nonsuch. Queen Elizabeth I ordered Sir Francis Drake, through her principal secretary, Francis Walsingham, to lead an expedition to attack the Spanish colonies in a preemptive strike. Drake commanded 21 ships with 1,800 soldiers under Christopher Carlet, and they left Plymouth in September 1585. Drake first attacked Vigo in Spain and held the place for two weeks, ransoming supplies. He then plundered Santiago in the Cape Verde Islands. After that, the fleet sailed across the Atlantic, sacked the port of Santo Domingo, and captured the city of Cartagena de Indias, which is present-day Colombia. At Cartagena, Drake released 100 Turks who were enslaved. During the return leg of the voyage in June 1586, Drake attacked the wooden Spanish fort at San Agustin in Spanish Florida and burnt the town to the ground. After his raids, Francis Drake continued on to Sir Walter Raleigh's settlement at Roanoke, much further north, where he replenished supplies and brought back all of the original colonists before Sir Richard Grenville arrived with more supplies and colonists. Drake finally reached England on the 22nd of July and sailed into Portsmouth to a hero's welcome. However, Philip II ordered a planned attack on the UK to prevent such attacks from happening again. On the 15th of March, 1587, Drake accepted a new commission with several purposes, to disrupt shipping routes, slow supplies from Italy and Andalusia to Lisbon, trouble enemy fleets in their home ports, and capture Spanish ships laden with treasure. Drake was also to confront and attack the Spanish Armada if it had already sailed for England. When Drake arrived at Cadiz on the 19th of April, he found the harbor packed with ships and supplies as the Armada was getting ready to launch their attack. In the early hours of the next day, Drake pressed his attack into the inner harbor and inflicted heavy damage. 
The exact number of Spanish ships sunk varies, but Drake claimed he had sunk 39 ships. The attack became known as the Singeing of the King's Beard and delayed the Spanish invasion by a year. In May 1588, the Spanish Armada set sail for England and arrived on the English coast near Cornwall. An English fleet of 55 ships under the command of Lord Howard of Effingham set out from Plymouth to confront the Armada. Sir Francis Drake served as Vice Admiral, commanding from the Galleon Revenge. As the English fleet pursued the Armada up the English Channel in closing darkness, Drake broke off and captured the disabled Spanish galleon Nuestra Señora del Rosario, along with Admiral Pedro de Valdez and most of his crew. The Spanish ship was known to be carrying substantial funds to pay the Spanish Armada. To capture the ship, Drake put out the lantern that had been leading the English pursuit, causing some disarray overnight. The Duke of Medina Sidonia, who had been appointed by Philip to command the Armada despite his lack of military experience, made his way up the channel towards the French shore in his flagship San Martin with the English in pursuit. He believed that if he anchored in the roadstead of Calais, the English would not dare attack the Spanish ships in French waters. A council of war was held aboard Howard's flagship Ark, where Howard, Drake, Seymour, Hawkins, Martin Frobisher, and a few others decided to launch fire ships. That night, the English launched eight fire ships into the midst of the Armada at its moorings, forcing its captains to cut their anchors and sail out of Calais into the open sea. The decisive action was fought the next day on the shoals off Gravelines, where Frobisher, Drake, and Hawkins pounded the Spanish ships with their guns. Drake's squadron gave Medina Sidonia's flagship San Martin a single broadside and moved on. Frobisher, directly behind him in the English line, stayed with the San Martin at close range and poured cannon shot into her oaken flanks, but failed to take her. In the end, five Spanish ships were lost. The most famous story about Francis Drake goes like this. Before the battle, he was playing a game of bowls on Plymouth Hoe. As he was warned about the approaching Spanish fleet, Drake reportedly said there was plenty of time to finish the game and still beat the Spaniards, maybe because he was waiting for high tide. However, there is no known eyewitness account of this incident, and the earliest mention of it was printed 37 years later. It's possible that the delay in launching the English fleet due to adverse winds and currents created a popular myth of Drake's cavalier attitude towards the Spanish threat. In 1589, just a year after the Spanish Armada's failure, the English sent their own armada to attack Spain. Drake and Norris were given three tasks. First, to destroy the battered Spanish Atlantic fleet, which was being repaired in ports of northern Spain. Second, to make a landing at Lisbon, Portugal, and raise a revolt there against King Philip II, Philip I of Portugal, installing the pretender Dom Antonio, prior of Crato, to the Portuguese throne, and third, to take the Azores, if possible, to establish a permanent base. During the siege of Caruna, Drake and Norris destroyed a few ships in the harbor of A. Caruna in Spain, but they were repelled. This defeat on all fronts delayed Drake for two weeks, and he was forced to forego hunting down the rest of the surviving ships and head to Lisbon. Norris led his army on a challenging march over the rocky coast to Lisbon, while Drake sailed around the peninsula to join Essex with his heavy artillery. Unfortunately, Norris's troops were sick and exhausted by the time they reached the western limits of the city. As a result, he demanded that Dom Antonio raise provisions and men to fight for his cause from among the local populace, or else the army would have to retreat. Drake had anchored his fleet in the mouth of the Tagus estuary, rather than risking sailing past the well-defended stretches of the Tagus to bring the desperately needed heavy cannon and ordnance. However, the anticipated rebellion never materialized, and the ground campaign was a total failure. So Norris, with his army and Antonio, re-embarked to make an attempt at capturing the treasure fleet. Unfortunately, the weather was not in their favor, so they eventually sailed for home. Despite the setback, Drake was determined to atone for the failure. He didn't want to return empty-handed and with the morale of his troops sunk. So he made a fleeting stop in the Galician Rias, or coastal inlets, 
where he pillaged the defenseless town of Vigo for two days and razed it to the ground. This abusive demonstration didn't leave the Corsair unharmed, and he lost hundreds more men on land, in addition to as many as 200 wounded. The growing defenses of the inhabitants and the arrival of militias from Portugal put the ships in retreat again. Unfortunately, two of the vessels sailing back to Plymouth were captured in the Bay of Biscay by a squadron of Zabras, led by Captain Diego de Aramburu. Unfortunately, the failure of the expedition resulted in a significant loss of life for the English soldiers and sailors. Buchholz and Key estimate that 11,000 lives were lost, while Robert Hutchinson says between 8,000 and 11,000 died. Gorachadegui Santos calculates the number to be over 20,000. It was a tragic and devastating outcome. Upon his return, there were questions raised about Drake's behavior during the expedition, and he was even charged by England's Privy Council of deliberate failings and mishandling his command. Although he was never publicly admonished for these charges, he did fall out of favor and wasn't given command of another naval expedition until 1595. Despite these challenges, Drake continued his seafaring career well into his mid-50s. In 1595, he attempted to conquer the port of Las Palmas, but was unsuccessful. He also suffered a number of defeats during a campaign against Spanish America and lost the Battle of San Juan. During the battle, a Spanish cannonball even shot through his stateroom on the expedition's flagship, but he survived. Despite facing challenges, Drake and his second-in-command, Thomas Baskerville, managed to capture and burn Nombre de Dios. They then attempted to cross the Isthmus to attack the city of Panama, but were unfortunately repulsed by the well-entrenched Spaniards who had barricaded the road. Sadly, they suffered heavy casualties and had to give up the attempt. A few weeks later, on the 28th of January, 1596, Drake passed away at the age of approximately 56 due to dysentery, a common disease in the tropics at the time. He was anchored off the coast of Portobello, where some Spanish treasure ships had sought shelter. Despite his passing, his legacy continued to inspire many. Before his passing, Drake asked to be dressed in his full armor. He was buried at sea in a sealed, lead-lined coffin near Portobello, just a few miles off the coastline. It's believed that his final resting place is near the wrecks of two British ships, Elizabeth and Delight, which were scuttled in Portobello Bay. Researchers and treasure hunters have been working tirelessly to discover the location of his remains, while divers continue to search the seabed for the coffin. Well, thank you very much for watching the video. We hope it was useful. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss our next videos. Also, if you are interested, we have already made a video about Elizabeth I, and you can find the link in the description of this video. Until next time.